Mr. Pepe Riley, thank you very much for coming on to TheBoxingBar.com, man, and welcome. Thank you. First question, man. What part of L.A. were you from? Where were you born and raised? I was born, I was raised in Glendale, California. I went to high school in Glendale. I started boxing, though, in all the gyms in East L.A. and the areas out in those areas, like on the east side and stuff. Any boxing gym that, was, that had sparring, we would go to. But I grew up in Glendale. And why the sport of boxing, of all things, man? I mean, how did you get into the sport? How did that fall into your life? Oh, uh, we did everything. We, when, I was, when I was a little kid, and my brother, uh, my dad's a sports fanatic, so we did the football, we did the baseball, you know, uh, little league, and everything. But uh, once I started boxing, everything just fell into place. I was eight years old. You know, I started winning fights right away, and kind of we just kind of fell on with the sport. Were you pretty much a mild-mannered person going into the sport? Yeah, I, I never, I never considered myself being tough. Uh, I always tried to be someone that thinks, you know, be a thinking boxer. I try to use intelligence. Um, I wasn't born with a big, tough body and then the tough stuff, the tough head, so I was forced to uh, try to outsmart my opponents. Uh, growing up, my dad, you know, he insisted that we be the smarter guys in the, in the ring compared to your opponent. Growing up, they're at home. Did you grow up in a loving family? Did you guys have a dysfunctional family? What was it like growing up? My, my family was tough. Uh, once we started boxing and I showed promise, uh, we kind of, my dad, when we were young, he said, you're going to go to the Olympics. I was like 10 years old. I'm like, okay. And it was tough. When I met Oscar De La Hoya in the gym at in the, in the weekend, we used to go, go, go do the fights. And we used to like, match people up to show up and you match, match yourself up against another person, right? And I ran into Oscar in a tournament when we were 10 years old. I ran into Shane Mosley at 11 years old. So once my dad saw that kind of competition come together, he said, I'm going to take you to the Olympics. You know, Olympics. I'm like, okay. And uh, after that, it was tough. It wasn't, it wasn't being a kid anymore. It was being apology, someone that was kind of uh, headed in that direction and everything around you, your whole life kind of uh, revolved around that from that point on. So the loving and all that stuff didn't really play a part as much as uh, the getting ready for, for the big time and, and, and making things happen and getting things done. Kind of, it, was a little bit, it was a little tougher than your average uh, childhood. And you just brought up those two legendary names, uh, Shane Mosley and Oscar De La Hoya. I know a lot of people are going to want to probably know you know, what type of kids they were, how, how good of a fighter they were that young. When I first started boxing, because I'm a year older than Oscar, uh, from the year ages of 8 to 10, I didn't lose. I didn't beat everybody. There was no one that, that could touch me. You know, that's what I remember, remember being a little kid, being so confident, and then being cocky, like, yeah, man, no one could beat me. And then uh, we took a summer off to play uh, football, I remember. And when we came back, it was kind of like a whole new scene, and there was new people and stuff. And the first time I saw Oscar, I, I kind of knew. I looked at him like, well, that guy's going to be, gonna be tough. Good-looking guy. He walked, you know, he walked on his toes, and you could tell he walked his shoulders up, and he knew what he was doing. So the first time I saw Oscar, they were actually going to match him up against my brother. My brother wasn't as good as I was. I was like, oh, so we held off on that. And uh, the week after that, I got matched up against Oscar de La Hoya, and we fought each other in, in, at the Hyatt at, at the City of Commerce. It was funny because uh, he was the first guy that ever gave me to see stars. He knew the left hook, and I saw stars for the first time as a little kid. And... Uh, Wow, even, even since then? Yeah, even since then, we were 11 years old. And uh, and since he beat me the first time, then I, we fought again like a week later, and I beat him. We kind of beat each other on the way, and, and we kind of grew, grew up together in, in the sport. You know, and Shane Mosley also, he was just part of the group. My father and his father were best, were best friends for a long time, and we all kind of grew up together into, into going into the Olympic, into the Olympic year for that. You're he, talking about Jack Mosley, right? Jack Mosley, correct. Joel De La Hoya, the officer's father. Like we all knew each other, all each other's families. We would go to each other's houses and stuff. What was uh, boxing like then for you, if you can remember, because that's pretty young. But what was it like for you? You think you were just naturally gifted, where you were good going into the sport, or is it, was it something that you had to really work hard at to get good? No, boxing came easy for me. I was tall and skinny, and I, like I said, I played all sports. I was naturally good at sports. My brother and sister, they were they were they were, they all they were really smart in school. And not that I wasn't, because I, mean, I like school. I thought that, that was important and stuff. But uh, when it comes to sports, like I was, I was a man. So whatever I did related to sports, I was always good. And so when I started boxing, it came really easy for me. But once you start getting into competition, like you know, with La Hoya and Shane Mosley and Rafael Arellas and uh, uh, Leo Spinoza's son, he was he was really good back then. And we all started fighting each other. And I was like, whoa, okay, this is getting serious. So yeah, but the, your question, yeah, it came easy for me in the beginning. There's a lot of people that would think, hey, what are kids doing boxing at that age, at 8, 9, 10 years old? And would that affect their schooling in any way? Or, you know, did that affect you in school? Or were you a pretty good student growing up in, you know, in your childhood? 
Well, my my father didn't let me. I mean, he didn't let my grades slip. He, if I didn't get if I didn't get good grades, that was always the first thing. Uh, he was very good about keeping keeping me in school, keeping me focused on that. As far as uh, like getting hit and stuff, when you're a little kid, the, the punches don't really hurt at all. So it's much more of a, of a game of you know stick and move, stick and move that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, as far as, as far as the grades and stuff, uh, it didn't, they didn't affect me as it might affect others because uh, my dad was uh, really good about it. How about your mother? What did she think of you? You know, being so young and getting into a sport like boxing. My mom loved it. She she was uh, very supportive from the beginning. She spent all my fights. You know, she's not one of those kind of moms that like likes to look away when I get hit. You know, she encouraged me to be tough and uh, and uh, challenge my opponent and what have not. Hey, you had a tremendous, I mean, amateur record. You know, experience there. What what was your amateur record by the time you uh, finished that? Somewhere between two three hundred amateur fights. I lost. I honestly I lost count, uh, and I probably lost somewhere between twenty and thirty, if that. You know. Once once you start getting the tournaments, you fight more often, so you know you, you have a lot more chances to win and lose. If you go like some of the nationals or the, or the regionals, you fight two, three times, five times in that week. So a lot of fights, a lot, a lot of fights. It just became natural. What type of big time tournaments did you win? The first time I, I was on the plane was when I was uh, 15 for like a junior Olympic tournament in North Carolina, and uh, I went over there and won that. And then from then I was just traveling all over the country for for tournaments. I won everything from I won the U.S. championships. I won the national golden gloves. Uh, you know, leading into the Olympics, uh, the course of the big trials and the box off. Uh, I don't know. The hard, it's harder to name because uh, they kind of bunch you up in your in your memory. But yeah, I, I won pretty much everything that was out there. And what do you think attracted you to the sport? What made you keep coming back every day to the gym? And you know, what what motivated you to keep you know going at this sport at a, at a part sport like boxing? What's well, it's tough. You know, once you once you know you're good at it. And once, uh, like I said, my father said, you're going to the Olympics young, when I was young. And I said, okay, like, I didn't understand what he was talking about. I just said, okay. And I kind of went to flow, you know. There's many, many times when I wanted to quit, when I wanted to be a normal kid. 10, 12, 13, 15 years old, you know. I didn't get to go to my prom. I didn't get to go any dances. You know, the night the night of the prom, I fought against, it was USA versus Ireland. So and that, that's fight. the hardest thing for a kid, too, as a teenager, like you're saying, a young man, to sacrificing all these things and giving them all up. Yeah, it is difficult. It is difficult, you know. But like I said, uh, once you know that there's an end, like a rainbow at the end, there, you kind of become like your own business, and you want to make sure you succeed there if you can. So it's kind of like it keeps you keeps you going. You know that it's possible to to, to make big money and get big big fame, and uh and then make something in yourself. My dad was that was the kind of guy. My dad was he was uh he was always telling us you know you got to make something yourself. You got to be better than the rest and the whole nine. So. It's kind of ingrained in, my, in, our, in our mentality, in our family. And at 17, you nearly made it onto the 88 Olympic team, and uh, you were eliminated, I believe. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but by one of my favorite boxers of all time, Michael Carbajal. How did that loss affect you and your life and your career later down the line? I fought Michael Carbajal in, in the 1988 Olympic trials, and he beat me. He was He was going into that. The whole tournament in, in the Olympic trials, he was already favored to win the gold medal in the whole Olympics, you know. So going into that, it was a little intimidating. But the thing is, I fought him a year before, a year and a half before in the U.S. championships. And when I fought him, I was 16 and I was a little kid, man. I, I didn't have a chance, you know. He beat me a unanimous decision, clearly, whatever. But the second time we fought, which is funny, I had hit puberty. And I came back as a much bigger 106-pounder. He's 106 pounds talking about and I gave him a much better fight, and I and I thought I thought if I pushed it, I could have took it out, I could have pulled it, but there is no way that the judges were gonna or the people were gonna give me that you know the chance to beat Mike Carbon in uh, in the Olympic trial. So I didn't take it the wrong way. I just thought like oh, it was a good learning experience, and uh, the next Olympics will be a lot easier. The next Olympic trials, I mean. And what what did you think of him? Like uh, you know the '88 Olympics happened, and he went on to win a silver uh, medal there. You know, what did you think of uh, his career and, uh, you know, what happened to him down the line? He, I, I believe he won silver. I, mean, I thought, I think they, they robbed him of, of the win of the gold, maybe. Yeah, I'm that's sure. what I've heard by everybody, yes. Yeah, and uh, and that was, like, we were, like, disappointed because we were rooting for him. Uh, once, like, when you're, young, when you're young, you know, and you're, and you're boxing, when I grew up in the boxing gym in East L.A. and in, in, in L.A., uh, there's world champions everywhere, you know, so I'm sparring Julio Cesar Chavez when I was a kid. And sparring like a lot of really big time pros from back in that era, in, in the in the in the in the early '80s, in the mid '80s, in the late '80s, in the '90s. So seeing guys make it and not make it wasn't a big deal for us. You know what I'm saying? 
And yeah, I, I do. Just what, while you were saying the, the last thing you just said there, your last statement, um, what came to mind was I remember talking to Chris Bird earlier this year, and he was saying the same thing with him. He almost made it onto the '88 Olympics, but he didn't. And he went on to the '92 Olympics down, down with you. And he said that was the best thing that could have happened to him because his body was still maturing. And by the time of the 92 Olympics, you know, he was full on ready to go. And if he would have got on in the, in 88, he probably would have done as well because, uh, you know, his, his body was still maturing and the experience, he just didn't have enough of that. Exactly. I mean, you have to be ready for, for life at, at, at your time. You can't force things. You got to let nature take its course. So whenever something like that happens and, you're, and your body is not physically as capable as, as the next guy, then you just got to take it and, and take it as a learning experience, right? And right, and uh, mentally as well. So, mentally, of course. I mean, you, you, you do what you can understand as much as possible. When I fought Michael the first time, like, I was a little kid, and I knew that even if I beat him in the Olympic trials, I might not, I might not have been ready to go on the, world, in the international stage like as much as he would. So he was a better candidate to go to the 80 Olympic trials than I was. It was totally obvious, and I brought that little story up about what Chris said, because uh, it was pretty obvious. At that time, you were fighting at Michael Carbajal's weight, which was, what, like 106 or 108 at the time. Yeah. And by the time you went on to the next Olympics at 92, you were a welterweight. So, I mean, it shows that your body was still maturing at that time. Well, the thing is this, okay? When I, when I was I told you, I grew up with Oscar De La Hoya and Shin Mosey, and we were all real close. So I was fighting at 112, 119, when Oscar De La Hoya started making a big name for himself at 125 pounds. At that time, Shane Moldy was 132 pounds. So going into the Olympics, I knew I was still growing. I, I had puberty, and it, I was really late. I was a late bloomer. I had puberty like in late high school. And I was going to go into, into a position where I was going to have to challenge those guys in order to be on, on that team. And my dad, like I said, when I was 10 years old, he said, you're going to Olympics. So I was like, whoa. He says, we're all together. Uh, we made a choice to try to fight at 147 pounds. And uh, I remember going to a tournament in Finland. And it was the first, first time I ever went to, and I, and I went to fight at 147 pounds, but I never weighed more than 141, 142. This is eating the whole nine, right? And I did well. I used my skill. You know, we, we, we grew up with a lot of training with a lot of world champions and sparring with them. So I did well against the international guy. I fought Mongolia and I fought Russia, you know, and, uh, and I did well. And I thought, okay, you know what? I think I could do this. So going into the, into the U.S. Championships next year, I used my brains, and I used the skill, and I, and I did well. Now, during the time of, let's say, the 88 Olympics, where you're still a teenager, um, you were known as Jose Salazar, right? Uh, well, yeah, I have my... my I and and I, you were I, legally I, adopted uh, by your stepfather. By my father, correct. I was 15 when that happened, the name change. Did you get to know your real father, or was that something that, you know, was he somebody that you never met? Yeah, good questions. <laughs> no, I never, I never met my real father. So uh, I, the only father I ever knew was my current father. How were you with with your family? Were you guys pretty tight, at, you know, at home? Uh, like, I, like I said, it was difficult because my father was very competitive, and he made a choice for us kids to do what we were going to do. My brothers and sisters are all they're all inter, they're all university graduates. My brother and sister went to USC. My little sister NYU because he said he has to go to college. Uh, I was the only one that didn't get a chance to go because I was too busy boxing. So having someone with a strong with a strong will on your side to push you, even when you will not want to do it, is a pretty good thing. And it, it gets things done. So when he said this is going to happen, that's pretty much what, what, what we, the direction that we're going in. Now, when you were trying to qualify onto the 92 Olympic team, you know, I'm sure you had some of the best, you know, fighters there boxing at that time. Was, was this something that you knew you were going to make? Were you pretty confident in competing in those box offs going towards the ninety two Olympics? I was, you know, I, I the year before that I had won the US championship and I and I, I pretty much blew everyone away because I I felt really comfortable with that way all of a sudden. I uh I was boxing really well then too. Uh the next following year, the Olympic year I won the national golden gloves. They qualified me for the US Olympic trials. And then there were some new guys coming up and there was a couple of softballs that were that were difficult. And uh, that was that was my biggest concern going into that. That I was gonna have to fight the two top guys uh, beside me were were softballs. So, to answer your question, yes, I was very comfortable. I was comfortable, but I was concerned about the softballs. Now, when you qualified the qualifying fight uh, to make you go on to the Olympics there for the '92 team, you know, you defeated a guy named uh, Jesse Brasino of Michigan, and that was in Phoenix, Arizona, where of course Michael Carbajal was from. Uh, mm -hmm. to go on to the 92 Olympics, what were the things that came to mind right when you were announced the winner 
besides the hot sun out there, you know, out, out, out in a tent, I believe, that you guys fought in. What passed through your mind, man? I mean, we, you know, we, to we qualify to really, go on to this team, you know, representing the United States. We fought at this really beautiful hotel. Uh, they built a, a, like a tent arena in the back. And uh, it was really, really extravagant show. Like the first time I've ever been in that kind of quality show or event. And it was it was pretty spectacular. We, all the top guys were there. You know, the Olympic box office is structured as the guy who wins the Olympic trials fights another guy who was, who was uh, picked by the coaches and the, and the critics and whatever not to come challenge the, the champion of the Olympic trials. So the Olympic trial champion has to win one, one time and he qualifies for the Olympics. But if he loses the first fight, he gets a chance to fight again. And he has to win that to qualify, right? So I already won the tournament, so I had to win one time. When I fought, when they picked Brasino, I was like, whoa, this is a tough fight. Because you know, we had a bird, uh, Chris Bird's brother, uh, that's his first name. His Chris Bird's brother, he was the other guy that was tough in that in that year. Yeah, his name is uh, Patrick Bird. Patrick Bird, yeah, correct. I fought Brasino again, and it was a really, really tough fight. When they announced my name, I was actually, seriously, I was still busy getting over being tired and, and what have not. Uh, it didn't hit me that I was going to be a, an Olympian until like that night. I was like, whoa, it's a pretty big thing. Writers and, and promoters and, and managers start talking to you. I'm like, oh, it's a big thing. What were the first thoughts, man? I mean, did you, you know, people say when, when uh, you win these big fights that things like flashbacks from your childhood come to mind and all that stuff. What were your thoughts right after you won this fight? What were my thoughts? Well, the first thing I thought was like, whoa, I'm going to be rich. <laughs> you know, I thought, that, <laughs> I, thought, <laughs> I thought I made it, that this is it. You know, all I got to do is just keep winning fights, and this is the first big step to being rich, but uh, I didn't realize it was such a hard road the whole way through. But uh, I was like, people were coming up to me and telling me how extravagant it was, but to me, the work was just about to begin because I was about to go to the Olympics, you know, so they're saying, oh, this is great, you're an Olympian, it's not, but I'm thinking, like, well, now I got to go fight the best guys in the world from other countries, you know, the, the, the work just starting to begin. But you know, I mean, it was fun, though, because we, we had a good team. We had The 92 team was, uh, we had, like, apparently, according to the, to, to the the writers, we had a best Olympic team since 84, when they won all those medals, and we were going to do all these great things, you know. Uh, De La Hoya, uh, Vernon Forrest, uh, I mean, Eric Griffin, we had a, really, a lot of really good guys, Chris Bird. So yeah. it was exciting to be part of that. Yeah, that was pretty much my next question. What was it like traveling to Barcelona, you know, with a team like that, with guys like Montel Griffin and Oscar De La Hoya, Chris Bird, Raul Marquez, Larry Donald, uh, Little E, like you said, Eric Griffin. Uh, what was it like traveling to Barcelona for this? It was actually a little surreal because when we arrived in, in Barcelona, they built this Olympic village that was unlike any other village they said before. It was the most modern, it was most well-protected. It was right on the, on the ocean, too. These beautiful big uh, towers that were the apartments that we were going to stay in. And the, and the Olympic village itself was um, very modern and hip, and it was brand new. Everything was new, and they had, we had our own private beaches, we had our own nightclubs. We had everything, all the food, and the restaurants were all free, and uh, the movie theater. Uh, when I first walked in the Olympic Village, I saw like uh, I saw the people from the morning show on NBC, the Today Show, you know, and I and I and, and CNN. And I, when I saw that, when I saw all the other writers and all the other journalists, I said, "Whoa, this is big!" And uh, that I think struck me most. Uh, traveling with a team like we had, we felt strong. We were all really well trained, and we were all in shape. So I thought we all thought we'd go there and, and pick these guys apart. You guys probably felt like superstars being out there and having, you know, having nightclubs and all that stuff. Was it pretty hard not to, uh, not to go out there and try to keep yourself disciplined to to stay away from that type of stuff while you guys were there? The first week when we got, got there, we had two weeks in Barcelona to get ready to, before the, the competition started. But we did it. We had our time to go look at the city. I mean, being in the city, being in Barcelona, being that young. And seeing seeing like that kind of extravagant event for the first time, like that was amazing. You know, Barcelona is one of the most beautiful cities in the world as it is. They have they have all the great architecture and, and, and all the modern you know, all the modern structures. And the people were really sophisticated and well dressed. And I was like, oh, it's just really amazing. It's completely different than life at home. So just being able to after training go out and walk around the city in the beginning was was enough. You know, and and they built the Olympic, Olympic stadium up on the hill. You know, and uh, that year also was the year of the dream team. So we had a lot of we had we rubbed elbows with the dream team on like every day on a regular basis. So the whole idea of it being surreal was brought together by all those factors plus being on the Mediterranean Sea every day. You know, when you wake up, you look out your window. So it was pretty extravagant. All these like you know great fighters that we spoke of that were there on your team. Which guys were you closest to, and you know what guys are were did you become really good friends with? Well, my 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 roommate was Sergio Reyes. 
Uh, we had four Latino fighters for the first time in, in like ever. It was uh, uh, Roma Marquez de la Hoya, um, me and Sergio Reyes. So we were we were pretty tight uh, for the four of us. I, my roommate was Sergio Reyes, so me and Sergio were really close. Then you know we watched this back and we we got each other up to run. You know when we ran together in the morning, that was that was like pretty special. And you know, we got up at dark when it was still dark and just go out there and kill ourselves. And your first bout there, I mean, it was against a guy from there, from a Spaniard, uh, Victor Baute, uh, who you outclassed pretty much uh, to get your first win there in the Olympics. Was it hard to fight a guy in his own country, you know, there in the Olympics? Was that pretty hard for you? Well, you know, that didn't we didn't find out the draw until, like, I think the day before the, before the, the show the thing started. And I didn't get a chance to walk into the opening ceremonies because... My fight was going to be the next morning, like at 10 a.m. or something. And I fought the Spaniard, so it was a home country, you know. I was like, I was relieved I didn't have to fight the Cuban first or something like that. But it was a home country of Spaniard, and and and, and, and traditionally, whenever they have, you fight the home country, it's going to be tough because they're always ready, whatever. Like so maybe it's a supernatural thing, but whenever you fight the home country, it's going to be tough. So I didn't get a chance to um, walk in with the with the team with the USA into the opening ceremonies because. I had to be home and in bed and ready for my fight very next morning on the first Olympic competition at 10 a.m. So when I when I fought the Spaniard, who was I really really tough, I was really nervous, but I was lucky enough to fight. I felt good that morning. I fought well, and I, and I ended up stopping him. Your next bout in the Olympics uh, is that the one that you were eliminated in? I was eliminated in the second fight against one of the Russian countries. Uh, I fought a left-handed guy who was so awkward that. It was like the first time I fought anyone this awkward. I'm sweating. This guy could have been off the street. He could have been on his first day of boxing because he was. Yeah, that's how awkward he was. I could. I couldn't figure him out. The second part of the fight. Yeah, uh, I think I remember. I heard about that. That it was like a really, like a real dirty and like awkward, sloppy type of fight. Really dirty, sloppy southpaw who wouldn't let me get near him, and and whenever I did, he went crazy. Almost like a, he went into convulsions, <laughs> and um, I didn't get the hang of it until, until the second part of the fight. But that year was the first year of the, of the new scoring system with, with the points. And I had a really unfriendly uh, referee from, I think, it was the Philippines, who was just completely against uh, against, against our side, the Americans and what have not. And, and the, all those factors put together ended up in a real sloppy fight in the beginning. But I did I did come back really well in the second part of the second half of the second round. In the third round, I was just basically chasing him on the ring, and he wouldn't he wouldn't stand still, you know. And I think if it would have been the five, the five man scoring system of the past that I was used to, I won the fight easily. But because of the new scoring system and and and, and his style and the whole thing, uh, he was scoring points when I was trying to get near him. There was a time when he was running around the ring. I remember. Did, didn't he hit you like with a low blow or something like that? Low blows, he low blow, back of the head, everything, everything, everything you could think of. He was. I guess every time I got near him, he just went crazy and uh, almost like he was going convulsions and, uh, and I couldn't really get anything off. There was a time in the third round when I, in the Olympics, right? There was a time in the third round when I stopped and I looked at him and I said, all right, stop moving. And he looked at me and he, said, he shook his head like, no. <laughs> and he kept going. I was like, oh man, hey, this gang going to stop. So it was a very difficult, awkward fight. Now, like after a loss like that, you're out of the Olympics and you're like, man, this is my dream. And so many times that we, you know, heard those stories of somebody that got robbed in the Olympics. What did that do for you? I mean, were, did you go through a depression stage? What were you like after this experience where, you know, you were taken out of the Olympics for, for reasons like this? It's difficult to be depressed with all the achievements and all and, and that happened that year, you know, being in, and being part of that. It's difficult to be depressed when you're in the, in the most beautiful place in, in the world for that time, every day, and around people achieving things, you know? So I just said to myself, I told myself, like, I got another week and a half to spend in Barcelona. I'm going to support the rest of the guys. You know, hopefully we can get some good wins, and I'm going to enjoy being here. I, I trained my whole life from the age of eight to I was 21 when I, when I went to the Olympics. That's 13 years of training for one event. So when it was over, I was a little relieved, and... I was in a beautiful place in the, in the time in the world, which is the Olympic. The whole, the whole world came to one, one city to hang out. So I wasn't really freaking out about being depressed or anything. I was just enjoying that. And I knew that I, when I came home, I was going to have a good pro career. The amateurs nowadays is a lot different now. What do you think of amateur careers? Do you think that's important to say, uh, you know, get as much amateur experience as you can? Or do you think it depends on the person's style, if they should become pro or not? Or, you know, what do you think of that whole amateur uh, experience, uh, you know, before they become pro. Do you think it is important to stay 
amateur and get that experience and rack that up? I think that if you don't if you don't go through the amateur programs, you're not going to know what it's like to be in competition and, and you're giving yourself you're not giving yourself the proper chance to know what you're going to be dealing with. Um, going into am- fighting an amateur fight, I tell all the guys, young guys, fight as many fights as you can. It doesn't matter whether you win or lose. Just learn how to be a part of the program and learn how to give yourself a better chance to learn how to win later on in life when you when, when it becomes really serious. You know, if you don't have what it takes. An amateur, sometimes you blossom as a pro because you went to the program as, a, as an amateur. And you know what competition is like, and you know what to expect. You know how to get nervous. You know how to overcome the crowd. You know how to overcome all the styles that they put in front of you. You know, it's, it's, it's just like life. It's like another part of life. Life throws things at you. And, and being in, in, in competition when you're young, it teaches you how to overcome these things. Um, you know, when I, told, I just I was telling one of my friends recently that I learned how to deal with fear as a young person, you know, how many people get to say that in life? How, how, how many people can say they can go into, into a situation where you're going to have to go into fear, you know? A tiny percentage of the people in, in society today can say that. You know, being in boxing and being in competition teaches you that. So I think being an amateur is completely necessary and it's really important. And to be thrown into fear at seven or eight years old and doing that time yeah. after time, you know, you for all those years. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and sometimes, like I say, sometimes you don't want to feel like competing. Sometimes you find a guy who, who, who everyone's afraid of. Sometimes, you, you know, you go in there and fight someone that you know you're not going to beat, but you got to do it anyway. Well, that's some great advice, and that's some great things uh, for, you know, any amateur kids that might be listening or kids that are thinking about going into boxing there. Your first fight, you fought Mark Fernelli, and I just saw that actually today. I got to watch it on YouTube. What was it like when you got there to that arena that day for your first pro debut fight? You know, were you nervous? Were you scared? Did you think it was another day in the office? You're going to be like naked there instead of, you know, you're not going to have your shirt on. You're not going to have the headgear. You're going to have lighter gloves. You're going to get hit harder. I mean, was that a totally different experience? Were you pretty nervous for that? Well, when I fought my first pro fight against Mark Fornelli, it was on ESPN. Coming out of the Olympics, I was kind of highly touted, so they said, okay, you got the pro contract with the top rank. I went, you know, I went to Bob Adams' house in Malibu to sign the contract, which is cool. I, I was on TV almost every time I fought, so I had a lot of things to live up to. I was a little bit nervous, mostly because people started expecting things from you, you know? They, wanted, they expected you to, to win and to take them on a ride like you know, like you did when you were younger. Being part of the Olympic program and being an Olympian in the beginning was like, whoa, it was great. But it, all of a sudden, it brings all these things. People say, like, whoa, now we expect you to win, you know? So, like, that's tough. Uh, I was on TV, and uh, it was my first pro fight. The thing about it for me is that growing up in, in L.A. in that time, we had a lot of football champions we were sparring with and training with. So guys like me and Oscar, we were born pro boxers from, from the age of like 10 years old and on. So being, being a pro was uh, natural. Like for full fight, it was very natural. I got to take my time. I got to use my power punches. You know, I knocked the guy out. Something that rarely happens in, uh, in, in amateur boxing. So it, came, it, it, it wasn't hard. And you win your first four uh, fights by knockout. The first three were actually pretty quick in the first and second round. Your fifth fight, you end up losing by decision, and you were down, like, what was it, like twice during the fight. To lose, like, one of your first fights there and everybody's expectations of you being this Olympian, you know, was that a big setback for you? Because not so much because it would be, you know, a setback for anybody else because anybody could just bounce back, but because you were an Olympian, was that a big setback for you and you know, people's minds and people's expectations of you? Uh, you know, I fought a tough guy. We didn't, we didn't expect what we were going to get. When you're young and you have three wins, easy knockouts, you think, okay, you expect one of the same, right? I fought a guy that I should, probably shouldn't have fought then. Uh, he, had a, he had a lot of experience. He was really strong. And the first time, you know, those, when you fight an amateur, you use big, fluffy, 10-ounce gloves. When you fight pro, you use these little, tiny gloves. You know? This guy caught me by surprise. I went down a couple times. I got up. I fought... I actually woke up after he knocked me down the first time because I came in really, really like out of it. I was sleepy or something. I wasn't there. And uh, I came back and I fought hard. You know, he just he caught me a couple of times. If I think if he didn't knock me down those two times, I would have probably pulled the decision. But he didn't drop me. And then the point system changed and, uh, and uh, it made it into a really difficult, tough fight. And, and, and the guy won the fight. So And his name was uh, Joshua Renteria. Renteria, correct. And the next fight, uh, the sixth fight, you know, you being there from L.A., I'm sure you heard all the stories from all the, all your life, you know, of L.A. with all the history of all the, the big fights there. You're going to fight at the Olympic Auditorium where it's, you know, notorious. 
for having crazy crowds and you know they they have a wild you know mean crowd if if you don't perform well they're going to be on you in a second you will go ahead and fight that fight here and what was that like man going through that crazy tunnel in this historic event that i believe opened up in the mid 20s with even uh, i think jack dempsey the heavyweight champion at that time you know was there for the opening of that you know venue what was it like fighting at this historic uh, venue you know you know the first time i went to the big auditorium was when i was a little kid uh and I didn't know what the, what the big deal was then, but it was when Julio Cesar Chavez won the, full, the world title. No one knew who he was. Wow, really? Against uh, Mario Salvecchi, Mar- Martinez. Martinez. Martinez, yeah, yeah. I was there that night. And, uh, and and no one knew who he was. And we, my dad, you know, he got me and my brother. And we went down there. And it was, a, it was like a 100% Mexican crowd. Hardcore fans. There was not a seat available. And there's people standing in the aisles. Really, really, like, really hardcore fight. Uh, Did you uh, fight. smell all that smoke uh, in your lungs there? It was smoke in the lungs. There was fights in the crowd every five minutes, you know. The people were throwing chairs. And it was, this is a really rowdy, amazing, amazing experience. Something you can't, you can't even imagine. And that night, uh, Chavez won the title. When we left, and the, 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 the crowd was like, oh, ne- nothing you're ever going to see again. When we left, uh, we were walking out the back. We left early because we wanted to beat the crowd. And me and my brother and my dad walked out. And at the same time, a limo pulled up. And the only other non-Mexican person in that in that arena was Don King. He snuck out the back because he walked in there to look at Chavez, win the title, and I think after that he signed him and made him into the, you know, what he was. We, I got to see that, you know. But uh, yeah, going the Olympic fight the Olympic was amazing. Fight things like that. Yeah. I'm sure your your dad was a big boxing fan, and you probably were too. You know, growing up, what fighters did you guys follow, or what were some of you guys' favorite fighters? When I was growing up, uh, Chavez, I, I was he was my man always. Uh, I was still he's he's a spar at the James, and we used to watch him. Uh, remember, uh, there's a guy named, uh, named Marcus Villasana. There's, uh, Uzuma Nelson was always in the gyms. He was, they were all, they're all spying or with each other or against other people, or whatever, but they were always there. And, uh, he uh, was actually the opponent of, uh, another Mexican great, the last opponent of Salvador Sanchez. Salvador, exactly, yeah. From Nelson fought Salvador Sanchez. Uh, How about your dad? What, what were some of his favorites back then? He watched, started watching boxing like in the 70s, so he liked, like, guys like, uh, Alberto Davila and Daniel Red Lopez and, uh, all the all the guys that were on Friday night fights, I guess. Uh, yeah, and all the guys that fought there at the Olympics. At the Olympics, correct. So I grew up with those, with those guys in my in my mind because he was always talking about them. Do you think he had some of that expectation of you being one of those guys one day, like like those guys that he used to watch? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, he growing up with these guys and 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 being in the gym with them and stuff. It's like we just start when he fights, like oh, now we got to meet this man. These people are telling us to do in so many ways, you know, stuff. And you rack up, uh, you know, about seven or eight victories there, and then you fight in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and you suffer a first round knockout, man. And I got, I, got, I fought a guy who was in, in Albuquerque who was uh, an amateur when I was an amateur, and I knew who he was, and I didn't think nothing of him. I thought, okay, it's nothing. You know, this guy's this is not gonna be anything. I came out, he threw a lot of punches. He caught me in the back of the head. Okay, I saw the punch coming, and I went down on one knee, and they stopped the fight, and it was nothing you could do. It's one of those things. And when I was in the dressing room, I, I just saw myself like, damn, what I would that was, that was so quick. It happened right away. Uh, you know, what can you do? He caught me in the back of the head, and I went down, and, uh, I, and I guess the referee didn't like the way I looked. Okay, now I got up right away. People don't understand, you know, when this type, this type of stuff happens and they stop fights too early or whatever, I mean, how it affects somebody. I mean, it, it gets kind of crazy, and it seems to be happening more and more often, even today. Yeah, um, See, I don't want to talk bad about people because people do their jobs the best they can. Sometimes, you know, and then it looks bad. So you make you can't talk bad about everybody that makes the sport look bad all the time because some people are just doing their job. But there's been a lot of bad decisions lately. There's been a lot of things that would be considered uh, suspicious decisions. The referees get involved and, and things like that. You know, we, we, we haven't gotten that to that yet, but I trained Ray Beltran. And we just fought in, in uh, Scotland, and we went over there, and we beat Ricky Burns down, chased him around the ring, dropped him in the eighth round, broke his jaw. And then we got we, and we got to Rob. Oh yeah, yeah. we're we're gonna get to that right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That one. I just had Ray a few, yeah, on a few guys, weeks ago. These guys, these guys don't understand. Don't they don't understand or they don't consider the fact that other people's lives are at stake. And we'll talk about that right now. But back to you. you, you lose this fight here in Albuquerque. The next fight, you lose on points too. You win a few after that. You lose another one there. Uh, you fight one more. You win that, and that was the end of your career there. And you know that's pretty early for. For someone my last, that my last, my last fight, I won a decision. The fight before that, 
I was in Detroit with Emmanuel Stewart. After turning pro uh, in 93, I signed on with uh, De La Hoya and his group, Team De La Hoya. We went up to Big Bear, and we basically lived in Big Bear. We started that whole thing up there. Uh, I think there was one gym and maybe one other camp, but there was nothing that we remember driving up in three feet of snow, and we expected to get up and run the whole nine, right? And um, being in the, in the beginning, I was basically trained by whoever he was being trained by. Uh, towards the end there, I, Emmanuel Stewart took over for Oscar, and uh, me and Emmanuel became really good friends. And when Oscar De La Hoya fired Emmanuel Stewart, I decided to leave De La Hoya camp and go to Detroit and fight with Emmanuel Stewart for Kronk. So when I, when I was in Detroit fighting with Emmanuel for Kronk, that last fight I fought over there, I, I ended up breaking my hands, both hands, in, in that fight. My father guy from New York left softball. Yeah, Mark Richardson at the Joe Mark Lewis Richardson, Arena, yeah. the historic Joe Lewis Arena. Tommy Hearns was a main event that night. I think it was one of one of the, one of his last fights. And Emmanuel Stewart showed up to the arena late, and he, he wrapped my hands really quickly because he had to go wrap his hand. And uh, when I came out on the, in the first round, I, went, I felt I was probably the best training camp I ever had. And I felt so strong, and it was one of the, I remember how, how good I felt because I remember I wasn't nervous at all, and I was just like, damn, I felt so good. I went in there and I and I just went crazy. And coming back after the first round against Richardson. I had dropped him three times, and they didn't have a, they didn't have a three uh, knockdown rule there in uh, Michigan. Knocked the guy down three times, came back, and I said, this guy won't go down. He won't stay down, all right? After the first round, I came back, and I go, shoot, man, I think my right hand's broken. And he looked at me and said, you want me to stop the fight? And I go, no, 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 let me, let me, uh, I'll go get him out of this round, right? And so the next three rounds, I proceeded to try to stop this guy and get him out of there, but this guy kept getting up. I dropped him five times in that fight, and he got up every time. By the fourth round, I was like, all right, this is getting crazy. So I said, okay, I'm going to send him up for one final. I'm going to get my best punch with my left hook. One final punch. And uh, I set him up, came in, I threw my big left hook, hit him on top of the head, broke the left hand. So I fought the rest of the fight with two broken hands. And by the last round, I couldn't throw any more punches. So I basically was just surviving. I ended up winning the fight. But after that, uh, my hands were pretty much busted up and they were useless. I fought again and uh, sparred and everything. Was just, that was it. And you being in De La Hoya's Olympic team in 92 and knowing him for all those years and even, you know, since you guys were kids, from, let's say, that time to when you stopped training with them, like, let's say, in Big Bear after, you know, the, him and Emmanuel Stewart broke ties there, do you think there was a big change in De La Hoya and whether it be his attitude and who he was or was he the same De La Hoya that you always knew? Or oh, yeah, was, same, yeah, yeah. Ross is cool. He's, he's, a, he's a down earth guy and a uh, you know, smart guy, uh, of course, yeah. What made you finish at that point? What made you stop your career? My hands were broken. I had two broken hands. I mean, without that, you can't really be a boxer anymore. So I, I, I took a year off. I tried to fight again. Didn't I, I won the fight, but it was I, won, I fought a guy that I should have knocked out in the first round, but I ended up going to the decision. Um, and uh, after that fight, I said, I don't think I can do this anymore. So I waited a couple more years to see if uh, my hands would feel better than they didn't. So that was pretty much it. And since then, how did you stay active in boxing? Well, I took a, year, a couple years off. I did other things. I uh, I started doing um, acting. I did. Uh, I started doing commercials originally. Someone came in on the gym one day and said, "You should come off for an audition." And I and I and I went to the audition. I ended up getting this national commercial for Puma. And next thing you know, I have an agent and a manager for for acting. And so they started sending me on auditions. <laughs> so next thing you know, I'm you know I'm, I'm doing TV shows and I'm doing you know small parts in movies. So I did that for a couple years, and then um. After a while, they, they they tried to get me to be on this TV show, and they gave me this big, giant uh, bunch of pages to read on an audition. I said, oh, man, I can't do this. So I went back to the gym, and I started training people. Now, you think from all your boxing career and all the amateur fights and all the times since you were seven years old that you were fighting, do you feel any injuries besides your two broken hands? Do you have anything else like where you say, man, you know, I think this is starting to catch up to me, and this is I think this has something to do with my boxing career. Do you feel anything like that nowadays? No, nothing, nothing, nothing except my hands. Uh, I was fortunate enough to, to uh, learn how to box properly. Uh, I was considered a boxer puncher, but um, I always try to make defense first. So I was never was the guy who took all the punches or whatever. So I didn't suffer any any uh, of that kind of trauma. Uh, I was lucky enough to have a good body, man. I did. I ran and I did exercise and I never injured anything except for my hands when I broke them. And that's an awesome thing. Now, of course, how did you meet Ray Belton? I met Ray Beltran uh, when uh, Emmanuel Stewart was training me. There was his assistant, was a guy from Phoenix, and uh, we became really good friends. 
and even after uh, we left, after, after we came back to LA after leaving Detroit and staying here, we uh, we kept in contact. And one day he sent me a tape and he goes, "You got to see this kid. He's 16 and he's really good. You know, he's just he's got a two pro fights and that." So he showed me the tape, and uh, not long after that, we started working together. And all these years later, we're still together. How do you see him maturing in front of you? You know, since the first time you saw him or the first time you worked with him, uh, to let's say his last fight. And we'll bring up the rest of what happened there at that fight. But, you know, how, how do you see him maturing and what do you think of his progress? Uh, I think that he is reaching his peak now in, in the sport. Uh, he, he's, he's at the point, I think boxers in general, they're starting to hit their maturity in, in the early 30s. Uh, they're, they're smarter now than before. You know, back in, the, back in the day, a boxer was done at 29, you know, because they either didn't take care of themselves properly or they didn't have the proper training uh they don't have the modern training. They don't have the, the right diets. You know, they didn't get enough sleep or whatever. Not boxers are, are getting smarter and they're getting they're lasting longer. Ray's been there for a long time. He had a lot of issues with managers and promoters. Uh, you know, we've we've been uh, we've been with Don King before. We've got to go all the way down to Panama and and, and Mexico to fight. And then we've been with this these people. And uh, we finally settled down and we got. We got a good manager. We got Steve Fader, who works with us at Wildcard, and we believe good friends with Top Rank. You know, we got the Top Rank contract now. Uh, once we found the right place to sit, then things things started working out. We got the right fights. Uh, we went. We, we challenged uh, Hank Lundy in Atlantic City when he was number one contender in the world. He was going to fight Adrian Boner next, and we, in his hometown, we went and we beat him. You know, I've never seen Ray lose a fight, except when he we fought in when he fought in Panama. He got caught with some punches and he ended up getting stopped. And even that fight, he almost came back in and, and knocked the guy out. He never lost a fight that I've seen him lose. All the fights that he's, he's fought in the last couple of years, he won the fights. But they didn't give him the decision because he was in the hometown of, you know, to a Golden Boy fighter and on TV, a Showtime fighter. So he's, he's smarter, you know. He took you in, he went, as an example for the other guys, he went, Ray Beltran, he went the hard way. You know, there's two roads, the easy way and the hard way. Ray went the hard way. And now that he's where he's at right now, he's one you know, of the top two guys in the world. He he's there with all that experience, so he's much a much better man for it. Yeah, he's very much a blue collar type worker. This last fight, man, Ricky Burns. Uh, you know, this was going to happen in his backyard, and before the fight even happened, they said to win over there, he's going to have to knock him out, or else there might be some bad judging. That's pretty much what happened that night. Uh, Ray Beltran won almost every round in my book. They gave it a draw, thus robbing him of getting that victory and that title over uh, Ricky Burns over there. And how did you see this fight? You know, uh, going into the fight, I didn't have any expectations. Uh, everyone's saying you got to knock him out to win, blah blah blah, right? But I just the way I see it is, if you go in there and do do the job the right way, the right thing will happen. So. Once the fight was actually fought, yeah, I, I thought there's no chance that they're going to take the fight away from Ray. Uh, Ray's known for having his fight stolen from him. But after he dropped Ricky Burns in eighth round, after he beat him down most of the fight, he chased him around the ring and, you know, pretty much had him surviving. I thought there's no way they're going to take this fight away from him. He's on TV. You know, that that's a big thing. People have watched to watch. They watch and they're watching not only... In, in that part of the world, but they catch it all, all across the world, all across the world. So they get an answer for that. You know, they, uh, there's no way they can take it away from them and they end up finding the one way that make it reasonable for them is giving them a draw, robbing Ray of you know being world champion right now. What would you like to see happen in this? Is a rematch the right thing to do, or you think he just won and he should just go forward in, into his career? Well, we we all we we work we're a team and we all have a say and, and you know we have an input. I don't have a say. Um, we have an input in what we think should happen next. Uh, uh, Ray, listen, you know, you don't have to advise what, what we should do next. I think that we should, we need to go back there and fight Ricky again and, uh, and, 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 and get the belt and bring it back. Uh, that we're negotiating that right now, trying to make it happen. The WBO ordered Ricky Burns to fight uh, Tennis Crawford next, but we're trying to appeal that. We're trying to find a way out of that. So it's very possible we can, we can, in the next week or two, uh, that we can maybe make that happen if possible. Uh, I think that if Ray goes back there again and he fights Ricky again, he'll definitely come back to the belt. There's some things I think that I think Ray could have done better when he had him on the ropes or when he was trying to get the ring off. So, you know, there are things I'll, I'll put in his ear so he, we can work on these things. But uh, 
my job is to make sure that he's uh, that he, he gets you know the best possible training camp. And having you with all your experience, everything you've been through in your life, everything you explained today that you've you've gone through through Olympics, through you fighting as you know from when you were a kid to everything you've done after that, Pepe man, you know my final thoughts on you is uh, you know I've always wanted to speak to you. I've always wanted to have that '92 Olympian that I always hear about. You know, and along with all the other guys, all the 96 Olympians I always, you know, hear of also. But I've always heard of Pepper Riley. And, you know, when I talked to uh, Ray Beltran in my head, I said, man, I've never spoken to Pepper Riley, man. So it was an honor and a pleasure to finally get you on, man. And, you know, get your thoughts on your career, what happened to you in your life, and what's hap- still happening to you, and how you're still involved in boxing. Amigo, thank you very much for coming on to theboxingbar.com. And it was a pleasure and honor, like I said, to have you on, man. It was my pleasure, man. You're, you're, you're a really good interviewer, and, uh, and you, you have a lot of respect for the sport. So always good to talk to someone uh, to people like you. So I thank you.